School of Global Policy and Strategy, 21st Century China Center in person. Um, I'd also like to send a greeting for everyone online who wasn't able to uh, get here today. Uh, it's our pleasure to gather together uh, the, some of the senior faculty of the 21st Century China Center to talk about this landmark event that it will open on October 16th, the 2020th Party Congress, and to project what uh, Xi Jinping's third term might look like. I'm Susan Cho. I'm the chair of the 21st Century China Center, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion. Now, uh, our report, we still have people coming in, and everyone's very excited to be here in person, but um, our report is a little different from some of the other reports that people have been doing on the 20th party Congress. We asked our faculty to, based on their own research, to project what they think the third term of Xi Jinping might be like. And in addition to the speakers we have with us today, Victor Schur, Barry Naughton, and Molly Roberts, the other contributors are uh, Ray Shreja, Wei Shur, Michael Davidson, Blake Wong, and myself. So uh, I urge you to read the report. It's just 40 pages long. At least maybe read the executive summary. I think you'll find it very provocative and very interesting. Um, it covers such issues as uh, employment patterns in the state and private sector, uh, environmental policy, and the Belt and Road, uh, as well as public opinion in China today. So uh, now I'd like to uh, say something about the Party Congress and why it's so important. Of course, there isn't that much uncertainty about the main uh, issue that people are interested in, which is, will Xi Jinping get to serve a third term? And will the party Congress and the Central Committee uh, that meets immediately following the party Congress, will it award him a third term? And I don't know anyone who's predicting that he won't get a third term. But there are other uh, mysteries that will, will not be solved until the Congress and the Central Committee meet, namely the, the size of the Standing Committee, the composition of the Standing Committee and the Politburo, and uh, whether or not any of the other rules and norms that govern elite competition in China will be changed. And as our group got together to think about, well, what could we contribute to help the public understand uh, domestic politics in China at this critical moment, we thought that it might be good to, based on the work of our colleague, Victor Schur, on uh, factional pol elite politics in China, make some projections about the composition of the Standing Committee and to uh, see what difference it might make in how constrained or unconstrained Xi Jinping might be in his third term. Now, this may seem like, 
you know, inside baseball and really minor issues. But is Xi Jinping with colleagues who might question some of his uh, policies? And there might be some debate in the meetings of the standing committee that might be quite different from a Xi Jinping who is completely unconstrained. So that is the kind of framework that we were particularly interested in and tried to uh, produce some um, analysis in our little report and on the panel today. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, hand the floor over to my colleague, Victor Schur, who holds the Hong Yu Long Chair in China and Pacific Relations at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. His new book, Coalitions of the Week, uh, examines the coalition strategy of the founding leaders of the Chinese Communist Party right up to the present. So it actually sheds a lot of light on uh, elite politics today. So Victor has an amazing database of biographical data uh, that is housed in our wonderful China Data Lab. And uh, he's been doing a lot of analysis on this biographical database of the Chinese political elite. And by the way, it's all posted on the China Data Lab website where you can even do your own analysis. So I urge you to check it out. See if you agree with Victor's conclusions. Okay, Victor, floor is yours. Great, thank you. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Let me just switch over to my slide. Oh, no. That's not sure. All right. Uh, so as, uh, first of all, welcome everyone uh, to our panel. Um, this is, uh, of course, you know, with the 20th Party Congress being, you know, one of the most, perhaps the most important political event in China every five years, we of course had to do something. Uh, and you know, it's wonderful that all of us could really rally together. And I think all of us got involved in this. So it's it's really is amazing, including ex colleagues of even Beijing. Uh, so uh, very wonderful effort. Uh, and I think we're all pretty happy with the, the report overall. So please be sure to read it. Um, so uh, today, what I'm going to do is, of course, we don't know what the outcome is going to be at the 20th Party Congress. Um, and of course, there's a lot of focus at the Politburo Standing Committee level. That, of course, as most of you know, is the highest government body in the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so I presented two scenarios. Uh, but beyond just making guesses, like just, and these are just pure guesses. Actually, there's a new rumor that's making me very nervous that the age rule is going to be abandoned and Han Zheng can stay. If that is the case, all my predictions are wrong. <laughs> but you know, whatever, right? You know, what I do. Uh, but I will show you data that even if my predictions are wrong, it can still make something, something of it <laughs> because. I do uh, look at the factions and the factional autonomy of everybody in the Paul Bill Standing Committee and everyone who has a chance of getting into the Paul Bill Standing Committee at the 20th Party Congress. Um, okay, so here are my kind of two predictions. Uh, and these are predictions at the standing, uh, standing Committee level. In a moderate Xi dominant scenario, uh, there would be two retirement, you know, and God forbid if he abandons retirement rule that all of this goes out the window, who knows what's going to happen. But if the retirement rule, which is 67 or below, you can stay in the standing committee. Uh, but if you're 68 or older, then you have to leave the standing committee. This, uh, to be sure, is a relatively new rule. Uh, I actually traced it back. It's only as old as the 16th party Congress. This is when Leroy Wan was forced uh, into retirement. 
using that justification. So it's a new norm. Uh, so it could well be abandoned and you know, whatever, all these predictions are wrong. Um, if that were the case, Li Zhangshu and Han Zhong would retire. Uh, they would be re replaced almost certainly by Ding Xiaoxiang, who's currently Xi Jinping's personal secretary. The other person who could get into Paul Bill's saying to me is Li Chang, uh, who was his former personal secretary. Uh, I also think it's possible that Wang Kuiming could get into the Paul Bill's saying committee also. Uh, the other scenario is where uh, you would see a stronger degree of Xi Jinping dominance, uh, where the age rule actually gets uh, restricted even more so that you can only stay if you're 66 or below and if you're 67 or older, you would be forced into retirement. That rule, uh, the merit of that rule is that uh, two uh, very autonomous politicians in the political standing committee today, Li Keqiang and Wang Yang, they would be forced into retirement. Um, and then this would allow Xi Jinping to replace them, well, as well as Wang Huning, but as, as you'll see, Wang Huning is just kind of very weak figure and it almost doesn't really matter whether he stays or go. I mean, Okay, don't tell him I said that, but it's true. <laughs> this is all live broadcast. Um, but, you know, he just doesn't have a lot of followers. So, you know, in terms of um, his impact on the factional alignment at the top level, he doesn't have a lot of by that. Uh, so in this strong Xi Jinping dominant scenario, uh, there will be five open seats. And you would see, besides Jinping and Zhao Ji, the two people who uh, are already in the Politburo Senate Committee, you would see a lot of new promotions into the Politburo uh, Standing Committee, most of whom are Xi Jinping followers. So Ding Zhexiang, Li Qiang, obviously, but also Li Xi, someone who's in his faction. So as I'll talk about shortly, Li Xi is a very interesting figure commonly believed to be in Xi Jinping's faction, but has a large, a very large and autonomous faction, which is quite different from Xi Jinping's own faction. Uh, and then also maybe figures like Chen Minar and Hong Kuni can also get promoted uh, into the Politburo Standing Committee. But one non-Xi Jinping person that I think even in this scenario could well get into the Politburo Standing Committee is Wu Chunhua. Um, who's the, the kind of the young, uh, relatively young figure in the youth league faction and the last kind of high level politician left in that faction. At, if Li Keqiang were uh, forced into retirement, then he would be the last person. Uh, I think that if Li Keqiang was forced into retirement, he would use whatever political capital he had left over to push for Wu Junhua's promotion. Uh, then he would serve either as executive vice premier or the premier of China. Uh, I think it's in Xi Jinping's own self-interest to have someone like Wu Junhua as the premier or the executive vice premier, because uh, I think Barry will agree that there's a large chance that something will go wrong and you need someone to blame, someone who's not in your faction. Uh, okay. So beyond these kind of very nebulous predictions, uh, I also will show you a couple of things that I think hopefully you find interesting. Uh, so this is the size of these elites factions. Uh, and by factions, I mean these are um, people who previously have worked with these elites. Uh, and on the y-axis is a percentage. So it's the percentage of elites. Uh, by elites, I mean members of the Central Committee and alter members, as well as um, members of all the provincial standing committees. Uh, so for the Xi, for example, he has the largest faction. His faction is almost 12% of the central committee plus the provincial standing committee members. And also between the period of 2018 to, uh, to 2021, and by today, I mean uh, July of 2022, uh, his faction did not decrease in size at all. Uh, hardly at all. <clears throat> Whereas for Xi Jinping, uh, he also has a faction that was sort of almost 12% of the elite, but it actually decreased in size between 2021 and 2022. And of course, it's not because of a purge or anything. Uh, naturally, people retire in China. I mean, these, these senior officials, they're all in their late 50s and early 60s. So there is this natural attrition to everybody's faction over time. 
Um, so what's interesting about this is that when you see people's fat, uh, factions not decrease in size over time, I would interpret that as a result of a deliberate effort to promote young cadres, uh, at least to the provincial level, to replace the people who are retiring. Uh, and the politicians who have done that include Li Xi, uh, as we talked about, uh, also Wang Yang. So Wang Yang has a large faction and actually his faction actually increased in size a little bit um, between 2021 and 2022. Uh, and, and the reason why that year is pretty significant is because all the provinces had their party congresses and there was a huge wave of leadership changes uh, in this one year period at the provincial level. Um, see other large factions that are still um, active, you know, you see a lot of people in Xi Jinping's faction, you know, Chen Xi, Li Qiang, uh, Tai Chi, uh, you know, even Li Hongzhong, they, they all roughly have factions that's uh, equivalent to 8% of the elite. Uh, some of the smaller factions include Hu Jintao's faction is degrading very rapidly. You know, people who uh, used to work with Hu Jintao, they're retiring uh, and then they're not getting replaced. Uh, Wang Huning, as you can see, uh, just because he only worked uh, as a think tank person, you know, he has a very small faction um, and, you know, it grew just very slightly over time. Um, but beyond the, the raw size of these politicians' faction, the other important metric is the extent to which these individuals share their factions with Xi Jinping himself. Um, so the assumption here, of course, is that if you share your faction 100% with Xi Jinping, your faction is, people in your faction are going to listen to Xi, they're not going to listen to you, and you really don't have much of a faction. Uh, Wang Huning, again, here, um, his faction already is very small. And of course, uh, you know, everyone in his faction also worked in the same office as Xi Jinping. And so he doesn't really have much of a faction himself. Um, other people in Xi's faction, like Wang Kunming, Tsai Qi, uh, Ding Xuexiang, they also share their faction to a large extent with Xi Jinping. Uh, so the yellow bar are people who are in his faction, uh, whereas the green bars are people who are not in his faction. Um, so Han Zheng, also another politician who shares a lot of members with Xi Jinping's own faction because they overlap in Shanghai. Um, some of the politicians who don't share their faction with Xi Jinping include, again, Li Xi. So Li Xi is someone who has a large faction and one that doesn't overlap with Xi Jinping's own faction very much and is in a pretty powerful position right now, uh, Guangdong Party Secretary. So I think if he gets promoted to the Political Standing Committee, that's going to create some interesting dynamics, uh, a bit akin to the Liu type of dynamics. I don't want to make predictions there, but uh, a little bit. Um, uh, Wu Chenhua, of course, also doesn't share his faction with Xi Jinping. Uh, Wang Yang also doesn't share Li Keqiang and Li Hongzhong. Uh, so in terms of large and autonomous factions, we're really uh, watching out for uh, Li Xi, Wang Yang, uh, and Hu Chunhua. So I think those, what happens to those three people will determine the overall degree of autonomy. So very finally, uh, so today, so, so this is a ratio of all the ties of all the Politburo Standing Committee members that are shared with Xi Jinping. So today, 20% of all the ties of all Politburo Standing Committee members are shared with Xi Jinping. In a moderate Xi scenario that I sketched out at the beginning, uh, close to 30% of them would be shared with Xi Jinping. But in a strong Xi dominant uh, scenario, is going to be sort of 35% of the ties we share with Xi Jinping. So not 100%, uh, but certainly in either scenario, we're going to see Xi having more influence uh, over politics in China. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, now,
we turn to Barry Naughton, who holds the Soquan Luck Chair of Chinese International Affairs at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. He's obviously uh, the leading economist working on the Chinese economy, and where my longtime colleague at GPS, and um, he's written many authoritative books on the Chinese economy, including the major textbook on the Chinese economy, which is used in China, as well as in the United States and other countries. And his most recent book is The Rise of China's Industrial Policy, 19. 78 to 25. Yeah. So I'm going to look at some of these issues from the perspective of economics. Um, I'm not going to pretend, first of all, I don't pretend to know half as much as Victor knows, a quarter as much as Victor knows about elite politics. And also, economics doesn't give us the same kind of uh, insight into elite politics, but it still does give us some insight. And I think the, the way I want to approach this is, first of all, by saying that although we don't know what's going to happen at the 20th party Congress, we do know one thing. That is, decisions are never made at the party Congress. Okay. Right? What we're looking for is the reveal. But the decisions have already been made. We just don't know what they are yet. Right? So we're sitting there waiting. Now, there have been exceptions to this, of course in the history of the PRC, but very, very, very few. So that means this whole process is managed. And because it's managed, usually we assume that the economy is going to be in relatively good shape on the eve of the party conference. You go back five years, you know, 25 years ago was 2017, the 19th party congress, they, Xi Jinping and his economic capo, Liu Ba, had really done a fantastic job of sort of managing macroeconomic problems and dealing with different kinds of issues so that short term problems had been overcome. And as you went into the stream, into the 19th Party Congress, everything was copacetic, everything went really, really well. All right, fast forward to this year. Is it like that? Oh my God, no. It is a mess. The economy is in really bad shape. So in other words, Xi Jinping has bungled what we might think of as the political business cycle. You know, instead of having a bunch of problems put to bed, he's got a bunch of problems that are right on the top of the agenda. Chinese economy has so many problems right now. Now, of course, you could say, all right, a lot of this is just zero COVID. You know, zero COVID is kind of a crazy, excessive policy. But on the other hand, we got to say, it has prevented China from losing a million people, which is what happened in the United States. So you can kind of understand why they would be so deeply attached to zero COVID. And it's hard to let go of because when they let go of it, there will be plenty of deaths. So we do have this one caveat that, you know, in some ways, a lot of this is driven by zero COVID, but it's not just zero COVID. We've got a really serious problem in the real estate market. Real estate construction is down. Uh, there's lots of financial vulnerabilities that could well spread into, not so much the banking system, but into what, what we call the shadow banking system where lots of funds without full transparency are, are intermediated. And a lot of that goes to real estate. Now real estate's hurting. What's going to happen? Nobody knows for sure. It's only half of the situation with employment, partly because of zero COVID, has created a huge hit to consumer confidence. We've always had consumer confidence numbers in China, but to tell you the truth, nobody ever paid any attention to it because consumer confidence was always high, which is sort of true, right? Because China's growth experience has been so strong, consumer confidence has been also strong until April of this year, following the Shanghai lockdown, 
consumer confidence index dropped 25% and it stayed down there every month since. So in other words, China's households are saying, wow, I'm more uncertain about the future. I'm more worried, I'm more troubled than they ever had before. And just one more thing to complete this picture, capital is blown out of China at a very substantial, at least a hundred billion dollars a quarter and probably as much as twice that much. Again, there's lots of other factors. U.S. interest rates are going up. Capital all over the world is being pulled into the United States, et cetera, et cetera. But still, you can't help but feeling that this is an exceptional part of vulnerability for China as well. Because remember, China's supposed to have a closed capital. It's not easy to move money out of capital. That's not a topic. And yet, a lot of money is moving. A lot of money is moving. So this is a really, really unusual situation. Because on the one hand, we're looking at this leader, Xi Jinping, who seems to have awesome, absolute power. And yet on the other hand, he's unable to manage the current economic situation. And just as a side point, he's unable to put through important institutional changes in the economic system that almost everybody believes are necessary, such as tax reform. So hmm, that's weird. That's something odd going on here. I suggest that the likely outcome of this is that a victor scenario, we're probably more likely to see a, what looks to be a weaker she scenario. But I caution, not because he's actually weaker. I think we can guess that Xi Jinping is likely to say, things are not going that well. If I wanna send a signal of coherence and also as Victor could also maybe share the blame, then it will be clever of me to take a step back, bring a few more people into the inner circle, knowing that I have enough power to take a few steps forward afterwards. So that would be my tweet to Victor's um, prediction. One last point from the economist standpoint, this is also a kind of very striking historical turning point. There are a scores of very interesting, very capable economics policymaker advisors, technocrats, if you will. And they are all stepping down. <clears throat> At the top, probably the vice premier, the most important economic policymaker for the last 10 years, except for Xi Jinping himself, presumably, he's going to step down. There are plenty of people available to replace them, but none of them have the same kind of chops, same kind of experience and the same kind of global visibility that this group is leaving. So whatever happens, we're gonna see some big changes in the relationship between China and the rest of the world. Thank you. Lastly, uh, let's hear from Molly Roberts, who is professor in the Department of Political Science and the Data Science Institute at UT San Diego. She's the co-director of the China Data Lab. And uh, she recently won the Max Planck Humboldt Research Award uh, for 2022 for her work on how the Chinese state uses information technologies for censorship. And she has a, a new book, text as data, a new framework for machine learning and the social sciences. Molly is going to speak about the uh, media censorship uh, under Xi Jinping and how it might continue in the third term. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be a part of this. I, when uh, Susan and everyone asked me if I could contribute to this, I said, well, wait, I don't really know anything about elite politics. So, um, but we have been with my, I have a project uh, with my collaborators um, looking at the media under the We thought this might be a really interesting perspective to add. So this, uh, the Strangling New Media in China Under She, this uh, contribution is co-authored with 
Brandon Stewart, who's an associate professor at Princeton, and Hannah Waite, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the Deep Math Lab at NYU, and one of our awesome PhD students here at the UN. Um, and they've been working on this project with me on um, propaganda for a while. So what's really interesting about uh, media, both the traditional media and social media under she has been, we've seen this sort of really intense crackdown on the media, sort of in all areas. Um, we've seen arrests of social media users, we've seen control of the media, more control of the media by the party, we've seen a uh, crackdown on investigative journalism, we've seen an emphasis on propaganda, this has been in sort of all fronts. We've seen many, many reports of this. But what my co-authors and I were interested in is, did, can we actually quantify this? I mean, we do look at interest, we do want to use data to try to understand this and track it over time. So what we did is we matched millions of newspapers um, that we've uh, collected here at 27 China, the 21st uh, the China Data Lab, um, over this 10-year period, this last 10-year period, and we matched them to leaked propaganda directives. So where we know that there's scripting of, pro of propaganda in newspapers. And then we looked at how the patterns of those articles and how they differed from other articles. And we figured out a way to identify them in the news media. And what we found, um, basically, patterns of propaganda. So we were able to sort of identify scripted propaganda in these millions of newspaper articles. And what we've seen in the last two years, we can plot this over time, is we've seen an increase in the prominence of scripted propaganda. So moving to the front page of the scripted propaganda. We've also seen an increase in the consistency in which these scripts are followed. So less sort of wiggle room in terms of like how they their scripting. And we've also seen a big shift toward hard copy of that. Those are the main sort of things that we've found. And interestingly, we've also seen these huge spikes in the scripted propaganda on big, the big meetings. <laughs> and in particular, um, in 2017 and 2018, when um, the constitution was changed, we see that happening um, in the propaganda system. So we should expect to see that also this next month as we're following it continuously um, in, uh, in the newspapers. So this is really puzzling because from a media perspective, um, we've also seen this like very this an increasing um, technology te so technology and diversification of the media environment, right? We've seen increasing video, we've seen more inward lines on the internet. Um, and then sometimes we would expect propaganda to try to blend in with all of that choice that people have in media, right? We would expect, and, and people, scholars in political communication have written about this, that propaganda should start to blend in with the media. And we see a little bit of that in China, but uh, in, in this newspaper data, we're seeing sort of more turn toward foreign propaganda, a turn toward more obvious propaganda. So why is that? That's a huge puzzle. And it's a puzzle of like, will it continue, right? Um, so we sort of speculate about this in this report. So is this a fear of not following the center, right? We've seen a lot more fear recently in the media environment in China. Is it a fear that if you sort of move out of step with the propaganda line at the time that you will be punished or uh, have, there will be some reprimand for that? Um, is it a signal of dominance, right? So there have been um, scholars like Kai Feng Huang who have thought that propaganda is not about persuasion, it's about signaling dominance. And is that what's going on here? So is it a signal that you know you're in charge, right? And and uh, a deterrent signal. Um, or is it important? We've also have seen a lot of empirical work showing the importance of traditional media and setting the agenda in the um, in the online. So is it that this like sort of overtaking of the traditional media in order to set the agenda online? In either case, I sort of expect this to continue. Um, this dominance of the media has been she has made this a priority has said it multiple times as a priority and is something that um, you know uh, that I, I don't expect to sort of stop after we may see this spike right during the the, um, the, the party congress but I don't expect I expect these trends to continue um, and uh, this you know lack of blending in and maybe moving a little bit more fear and signaling dominance I think is also something that we'll uh, see and continue um, so that for their new turn it back to Susan. Yeah, I'd like to encourage the people who are joining us online to use the Q&A box on the bottom, bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your questions. 
we'll be cur curating them and reading them into the questions <laughs> that the in-person <laughs> audience will um, uh, will ask now. And I uh, also, a couple of other things, I wanted to mention that our report was uh, really woven together and beautifully edited by Perry Doche, our assistant director in uh, really his first uh, publication here at 21st Century China Center. Um, so I'd like to get us started in our discussion by asking the panel. Um, Barry has described a leader who isn't able to uh, manage the political business cycle. And there are a lot of problems in the economy now, which most people, including Barry in his little essay, say really have been self-inflicted uh, because of policy decisions made under Xi. And then we see, uh, as Molly described, a greater homogeneity in the media, which suggests that the way things work under Xi Jinping, you uh, subordinates feel a lot of top-down pressure to conform with what Xi Jinping policies are, not only to conform, but kind of get out ahead of other officials in showing how loyal they are by over complying with Xi Jinping policies, which is an argument I make in my about to be published book, Overreach. Um, and so the question is, if we have a different balance in the standing committee, will that really change this kind of dynamic of highly concentrated power, personalistic leadership, um, bandwagon of subordinates on Xi Jinping. And I'm wondering if the panelists might like to comment on that question. Victor? I actually have a question for your data. Um, so the last person that I noticed who tried to <clears throat> form his own kind of uh, narrative, I wouldn't call it ideology, but sort of um, the Gator Party narrative was uh, Liu Yunshan. And basically, there was this big disruption in 2015 uh, when, after that, he had to stop doing it because his son was caught shorting the Chinese stock market and made like a billion dollars doing it. Uh, and then his son got detained and he had to stop all of his schemings and so on and so forth. Um, so I wonder if that showed up in the data, because in the in the meeting database that I have, like he was chairing a lot of meetings on ideology, he was giving out a lot of instructions, like, oh, you can say this thing, and, and what he was advocating for should show up as slightly different from the Xi Jinping line, mm -hmm. uh, but then it all came to stop in like July of 2015. That's really interesting. We haven't looked at that specifically, but yeah. we do see a big shift right about then. That's when we see a big shift for our propaganda. Um, and so it could be some, you know, aligning with that. Um, but I'm gonna let's talk and I yeah, yeah. look at exactly that one today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks to stop here. Yeah. But that's a good turning point too, where that sort of initiative if, if we think of she the biggest initially kind of wanting to carry out an economic reform mm -hmm. and sort of trying to first year or two then that just about the time it stopped it doesn't work to give up it really didn't work they lost a trillion dollars with the foreign exchange reserve i think wow. but um but <clears throat> uh, i i i'd like to ask you to address my question <laughs> 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 a more constrained 
think it can can we sort of view these and can we see view that they're in and there are these other leaders with autonomous factions of their own who have their own political club are at least some of them in the category we might describe as pragmatic policymakers who if they have the opportunity to challenge might result in sounder policy. Um, so uh, this is my just qualitative reading of the style of different leaders. Uh, so you do see a slight difference between how Luka Chang would <clears throat> give policy speeches compared to someone who's closer to Xi Jinping, you know, like Li Chang or someone like that. Uh, Li Keqiang, of course, everyone pays homage to Xi Jinping. So, you know, it's like, what I'm doing is because Xi Jinping said this, and this is why we're doing it. Um, but Li Keqiang would constrain those kinds of remarks to like one paragraph, and then he would just get down to the real issue, address the problems, describe it, etc. Whereas someone who's closer to Xi would go on and on and on about Xi Jinping's contributions and, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is qualitatively, this is how I come to the conclusion that if you have people who are just going to be praises on Xi Jinping, you're not going to have very much pushback. Um, I don't think anyone will dare to do what Liu Yunshan did, which is to have his own narrative. I think that is just uh, too dangerous. Um, but at least if we have some autonomous politicians in the state council, they will be more willing to address the actual problems uh, and less reliant on this kind of pure phrasing of, of Xi Jinping. Darren? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with, the, with the, the broad spirit of that. I mean, the problem is not that there aren't plenty of capable, competent leaders in China. There certainly are. Um, I'm not a big fan of Li Keqiang. Personally, I don't think he's a... His, his, Economic vision doesn't strike me as particularly coherent or anything, but there are lots of smart people in China. So the problem is that the agenda is driven by Xi Jinping, and Xi Jinping doesn't really seem to care about most of the things that an economist would really care about. He wants things to run well, he wants things to run smoothly, but he wants them to run smoothly so that he can fulfill his vision of a very powerful strong China, industrial China, military China, and technological China. So I, mean, I think he's kind of obsessed with that and pushing to the detriment of the other things. And it's hard to imagine anybody challenging that in the short run. Questions from the floor? Uh, let's see. Don. So this, this is a question for Linda. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, it's often thought that um, when a leader is faced with a lot of domestic problems, very precisely, that there is a fear that that leader might look for a distraction. <clears throat> and of course, the distraction on most people's minds in <clears throat> China is will China move on Taiwan? And I wonder, because I think about this, listening to you, hit the wrong if she, as we all expect, is elected again, uh, elected, uh, carefully, um, are, isn't it more likely that uh, he will be more restrained, perhaps, in moving uh, against Taiwan because now he's got much more comfort uh, that his domestic failures are not kind of reflecting negatively on him? I mean, I think there, you know, it's definitely worth thinking all these different uh, ways of this interaction could be um, But he could also, you could imagine him feeling that, oh, this is my last chance. Um, that would make my mark on history now, and it's not necessarily looking back very well in other ways. I guess if I were she didn't think, I, I think I'd be asking them to most complete their analysis of what's going on in Ukraine first. Yeah, being told. Thank you. Yeah. 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 
I, I have a question. You want to be? Would you like a question from online? Yeah, but not necessarily now, but I'm ready. Yeah. Okay, next one. Okay. I know this panel focuses on green politics, but it gives the impression that that in China, the next five, ten years, whatever, it's all centered in the local. Central local relationship, as you know, has been the been core of China before, where you know, for a period, you know, businesses compete with businesses, and governments compete for this. That's the sort of the dynamics of China's economy and Chinese politics in some way. So the central local relationship. So given your analysis, do you, where do you see where the local come in? With the provinces, all these local leaders, Li Xi included, do you think they all will just uh, flip over and, and take everything from the top? And um, no core. <laughs> okay, so I only know the, the skill data, uh, which Barry also knows, but what I've noticed is this. So there was a time when there was a lot of fiscal autonomy among some East Coast provinces and cities like Shanghai, Guangdong. Uh, that fiscal autonomy is disappearing. And so that everyone now looks to the central government for subsidies, uh, for some provinces, they don't have enough money to just run the government, basically. Um, salaries are being cut. Even police salary is being cut this year. Um, and so that, that's one of the reasons why, you know, in Hunan and places like that, big protests, no one did anything for a while, and then the provincial police came in and finally cracked some skulls. The fiscal situation really is not in good shape. And, and I really don't know how they would deal with that because you either borrow even more money you know, the further, I think that's really basically what they're gonna do. Um, but basically the, the, you know, sort of Susan's earlier work where these provinces, a lot of autonomy, they would voice their disagreement with the central government. I think those days are largely over because um, even for you know previously very autonomous, very dynamic places like Guangdong, they are increasingly dependent on central government subsidies. Well, I, I might just throw in uh, one anecdote from an interview I did in which uh, a businessman investor was amazed that the provincial officials in the Central Committee uh, just didn't seem to resist the constitutional change at all. And, uh, and he always thought about provincial officials as kind of protecting private business people. And that if they're not going to stand up and protect the precedence of peaceful turnover of power at the top, then his view was the situation for the private sector in China, where it's also pretty gloomy with the provincial officials, which are, I mean, of course, that was a constitutional change was not in the central committee, but still that they were so docile now. So Okay, Harry, would you like to? Sure, I'll weave together a bunch of questions okay. about the economy and COVID bureau. Okay. So, in general, people are noting that you know they're wondering if the COVID bureau policy will continue given all the economic um, turmoil that has called caused. People are curious about uh, the PBOC, what we have, uh, the sort of response that people have characterized to the uh, RMB putting to the low point as per se the response has been lackluster. Does this have to do with people retiring and leaving? Does the retirement of officials of PO, POD harm the credibility of the central bank in the eyes of the international community? And what does that mean for China essentially as a borrower or you know lender, yada yada? Um, so lots of questions about that and another more broad question of does Xi Jinping care about the economy? Does he think that the CCP's legitimacy is attached to national rejuvenation and not to economic growth? So that was me trying to get like six questions. So feel free to enter any further. Uh, 
from there. Yeah. Um, let me start with the last one because I, I personally believe that Xi Jinping does not care about you, except in so far as it provides the resources to, to make China a strong power. Of course, obviously there's tension uh, and he wants things to go okay, but he doesn't actually think about it or try to make it go well. Um, you know, the PBC, every, I mean, internationally, the PBC's reputation is fine because every country in the world- China Central Bank. Yeah, the China Central Bank, the People's Bank of China. Uh, because every country in the world is trying to manage this very difficult interest rate environment where U.S. interest rates have gone up really fast and really high, and the U.S. dollar is appreciated. So the incentives to move money out of everywhere, including China, the U.S., uh, is very high. And PBC has not done a bad job of managing it. So, so no problem. In fact, if anything, probably the international financial community is under paying attention to the, what might go wrong. Uh, with the Chinese uh, exchange in that one. Um, yeah, um, so, um, okay. so it's, it's not. I mean, a quick word about the exchange trade. Um, but yeah, I have to give them credit. They they foresaw this might be a problem one day and they started this flexible exchange rate regime. But the problem is it's not a totally flexible exchange rate, it's limited. And now they're hitting up against a ban that they had set forth you know, a few years ago, which is 7.2 to the dollar. So then if it keeps on depreciating, so I actually, I was talking to these uh, like Goldman Sachs type people. It's like, <laughs> it would be interesting if it hits up against the Hong Kong dollar exchange rate. That's when things get super interesting. Mm -hmm. Pure, pure because, nominal. Because that's it's utterly what, meaningless. Well, it's utterly meaningless, but then it's like, you depend on that. Yeah. Well, because actually in Hong Kong, it's not meaningless. They have a big exchange rate. Um, so then, you know, is remedy going to fall below the Hong Kong dollar? I find that hard to believe. They kind of have to. Uh, that's that's one thing. Well, we'll see if it gets to that point. Who knows? Right? <laughs> Let me ask a general question. In most countries, when there's a regime change that includes a lot of mobilization, no matter what the police are doing, there was some tipping point in event. When Roe v. Wade was overturned, you saw a very big change in this country when the invasion of Cambodia incurred, occurred during the Vietnam War. There were millions of people on their way to Washington to protest the enlargement. What would be a tipping point that you would look for in China? It could be with the, uh, the economy, the jobs of the college students. If, where would you expect something possibly to get out of control in at least a city or two. I don't think it'll be taking the, the veil off a woman, but it, who knows, but it could be. Otherwise, I don't care. That's tough. Um, you know, I think, guess off the top yeah, of your, your own experience. I think, I think it's, a, it's a good question. It's a really good question. Um, it's one uh, where sort of we've seen over many, many years people sort of predicting what is the tipping point? You know, what is the the sort of uh, uh, change where where it becomes too much, where there's, where there's things get out of control? And over and over, we think that things haven't gone out of control. Maybe it's because we were anticipated, right? And so they know where, where, that, uh, where that line is. And I think maybe it goes back to in she's legitimacy and the legitimacy of the state based on nationalization or the economy. And then for a long time, it was like everyone. And maybe that's changing. Um, and um, I mean, I think public zero is one example where we see. Um, you know, a policy really tied to um, more to national than maybe even to the economy, right? And so, and and we see that in the um, So maybe we see the source of the legitimacy changing in China. Um, but I don't know where that. I don't know um, where, uh, if anything, would get out of control. We also see a greater surveillance state, um, much stronger. Uh, it's much more difficult for. There's a lot more fear, a lot more difficult for, I think, for people to, um, for that tipping point to occur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, just to follow up uh, on what Molly said, I think the regime does a good job in trying to anticipate uh, the kind of risk, uh, risky areas. So I think for them, there's an internal calculation, which is that you don't want to uh, infringe on the core materialist interests of urban residents, permanent urban residents. So you don't want them, a, a large number of them to lose their homes, to lose jobs, um, to you know, suffer uh, great economic setbacks, to lose a lot of money, their savings. So whenever these kinds of events would happen, uh, so recently in Florida, we saw this case where this underground bank blew up, all these people lost all their money. Then we also saw people not getting their homes that they had paid for already delivered. The central government time and again had been willing to spend a lot of money to address these kinds of issues that potentially can harm a lot of permanent urban residents. They don't care about rural residents. They don't care about migrant workers. Their interests can be harmed you know, all day long. But for permanent urban residents, there is some sense that you don't want to piss off, you know, this constituency. I don't know if you agree with that. So maybe so can I ask a question related to that? Sorry. Yeah. So does the central government have enough money to resolve those problems? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's it does. Yeah. Well, no, but they don't have to totally. It's like this housing thing, right? So yeah, they're like whatever, several hundred thousand people, they're not getting their homes. They're spending enough to deliver 50 to 60,000 homes to people in the next few months with the promises to the other people that, oh, eventually you'll get your housing. And then they were like, oh, well, some central government's involved. I know at some point I'm going to get my home. Then, then they relax. They're not going to protest. You know, it's flood of our liquidity or a year. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Sarah, you mentioned that there's a capital fund, which I assume predates the U.S. interest rate horizons. To some degree. Yeah. So, whose money is it? Where is it going? And is there a significance in either the source or the destination? Um, we don't know whose money is it. I mean, this is, this is we put together the balance of payments. There's big errors and omissions. Profit remittances fluctuate a lot. So these are approximated through lots of other things. And we see, you know, the macroeconomic identities have a big trade surplus, and yet their foreign exchange reserves are falling. So from all these things, we can deduce that there is this capital outflow, but we don't know that much about it. Uh, Victor might know a little bit from his uh, insider <laughs> sources. <laughs> Back in the day, when I did uh, well, it is very puzzling now because um, a lot of Chinese people they can't even leave China. Right? So there used to be a lot of tourism, so-called tourism. They go to Macau, you know, change money in the under, underground banks, uh, and a lot of money uh, flowed out that way. These days, it's like, how is the money getting out when people are not leaving China? So it is a bit puzzling. When you have businesses, they will not send them back. Uh, they are they are not winning bets in the China. They are winning bets. They have to research in in Hong Kong, in Singapore, U.S. But the U.S. is not sending the manufacturing to China, and so they are not all offset. Yes, those things will have I mean, rich guys can have many ways to to, uh, to to get the money out of China. Okay, well, we're nearing the uh, end of the hour. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we do things that are hybrid with Zoom, we are much stricter about our time and time. So thanks so much for joining us. And now um, we'll certainly all be watching to see uh, what the standing committee looks like. We haven't talked at all about the political report to the party Congress, which could be interesting as well. So uh, it'll uh, stay tuned and uh, we'll see how well our 
faculty predicted. <laughs> what where it'll take a lot longer because what we were really trying to do is protect the third term, not necessarily just protect the outcome of the uh, only to watch them. Anyway, thanks so much for joining us. I look forward to seeing you next week when I'll be reading my electronics. Oh, yeah, here's an announcement. I'll be talking about my new book uh, a week from now. So please come back and join us. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>